Christian Martyr. I'm going to be back here again in Liverpool. And I remember always in Liverpool because through, three years ago, I guess, I came here the first time, plus or minus. The, this is where we got the communion rail trick, which is to put all the chairs like this and face them the other way. And it saved many, and uh, we have many of our, our uh, communion rails. These are our communion rails everywhere now. So, so you exported your communion rails everywhere in the world. They're in Australia, they're in the United States, all over the place. So you may have to put a patent on it. <laughs> but in any cases here where at first uh, they, we have the problem of people you know, falling down when they go to communion, some of the older ones and so on, and some of the younger ones that are uh, more seismic. And uh, so that, uh, but in any case, it'll be, and also to create a little, a little gap for the sanctuary, so it works out well, you'll turn the chairs around backwards straight. And uh, so in any case, so just so you know, your patent went all over the world, you know, those were just the Beatles. That came <laughs> so, but uh, in any case, the epistle for this is going to be back after quite a while. And uh, this is the epistle for this feast of St. Simeon. It's taken from James. Uh, chapter 1. Beloved, blessed is he who endures under trials. When he has, when he has, uh, pro when he has proved his worth, he will win that crown of life, which God hath promised to those who love him. Nobody, when he finds himself tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. God may threaten us with evil, but he does not himself tempt anyone. No, when a man is tempted, it is always because he is being drawn away by the lure of his own passions. When that has come about, passion conceives and gives birth to sin. And when sin has reached its full growth, it breeds death. Beloved brethren, do not deceive yourselves over this. Whatever gifts are worth having, whatever endowments are perfect, are, are, are perfect of their kind, these come to us from above. They are sent down by the Father of all that gives light, with whom there can be no change, no swerving from his course. And it is and it was his will to give us birth through this through his true word meaning us to be the first fruits, as it were, of all creation. In the Gospel. Taking that according to St. Luke chapter 14. At that time, Jesus said to the multitude, If any man comes to me without, having, without, have, without hating his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, and a yes in his own life too. He can be no. He cannot be my disciple. A man cannot be my disciple unless he takes up his own cross and follows after me. Consider if one of you has a mind to build a tower. Does he not first sit down and count the cost that must be paid, and if he is to to have enough to finish it? Is he to lay the foundation and then find himself unable to complete the work so that all who see it will, will, fall, will, will fall to mocking him and saying, Here is the man who began to build and could not finish his building. Or if a king setting out to join a battle with another king, does he not first sit down and deliberate whether with his army of 10,000 he can meet the onset of one who has 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still at a distance, he dispatches envoys to ask for conditions of peace. And so it is with you. None of you can be my disciple if he does not take leave of all that he possesses. That's one of the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father and Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. You know that in olden times, except with Jesus on Sunday, just a few days ago, was considered the very first day of the liturgical year, and this would be considered the first week. One of the points that St. Gregory the Great made in his sermon of this last week is that 
in the gospel which speaks about the, 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 the hiring of the laborers throughout the entirety of the day is that God will send preachers and there will be warriors from the beginning of time until the end. So those who were hired at the beginning, Adam to Noah, then there were those hired at the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and then even at the eleventh hour, he went out to hire laborers. And so there will always be laborers in the harvest, and there will always be the same supernatural battle. We will always be in a war between heaven and hell, from the beginning of time until the end of time. And God will always send laborers to the harvest. He will always call the same battle. And one of the, one of the challenges, in fact, one of the very negative effects of the great evil that has beset our world, which came from Protestantism. Protestantism is the cause of the whole modern world and all its wickedness. And that paganism could not produce the wickedness of the modern world, but Protestantism did. Protestantism created birth control. Protestantism created Charles Darwin. Protestantism created evolution. Protestantism created atheism. Protestantism created all the wickedness of this fake liberalism of our age. Protestantism says, like Bishop Sheen points out, created too many showers, too much tooth brushing. He says, you know, that people today always brush their teeth. People today always brush their teeth and they make sure their teeth are clean because they know their souls are dirty. And they always use soap. Protestantism brought too much soap in the world, and too much teeth, too much brushing of the teeth, and no fake fakeness and death in the family by abortion and birth control. And it brought the death of saints. It brought the death of saints. Not the complete death of saints, but almost the total death of saints. Because think about it. We say, only by faith alone can you be saved. This means you do not have to work. You do not have to do something for God. You don't have to fight. You just believe in the Lord Jesus, and you are saved. And this is a lie. As a great founder of Protestantism, who now burns in hell and is ready to be canonized, we were discussing yesterday what exactly does a canonized saint get in hell. <laughs> but nonetheless, he's about to be canonized as he burns in hell on the 500th anniversary of his demonic act of starting, of nailing 95 demonic theses on the church of Wittenberg. What did he say? He said, sin boldly, but believe more boldly. That's what Luther said. Sin boldly, but believe more boldly, and only the Bible saves. You know what's nice about the Bible? It's like this book. Imagine that England and uh, America and all countries were run by laws. And laws are in a book. It's called the law book. So this book says, I should not steal from you. So I rob. And the book can't arrest me. The book can't put me in prison. The book can't shoot me while trying to escape. The book can't do anything. So I'm a firm believer in the book. I firmly believe in the book. And of course, remember, and now, now the way in which I maintain my justice is the book says thou shalt not steal that which you do not deserve. And it is stealing when you take what you do not deserve, of course. It's also st stealing when you take something that another person does deserve. Now it's true that I don't deserve your car, but I see the way you take care of it. <laughs> I see the way you live. I see your attitude. And you don't deserve your car. And so the interest of the common good, I have to take it. <laughs> and so every single sin can be justified. Every single evil can be justified. And we have a new kind of man that pagans never dreamed of. A kind of man that can live in perpetual sin and use the book of the Holy Scriptures to prove that he's a saint. He can live in wickedness. He can live in lies. He can abort his children. He can divorce his wife and divorce, divorce the husband. He can, live, he can not go to church. He can hate God. He can despise the Holy Father. He can stay away from the sacraments. He can live in the Holy... He can receive the sacraments and the sacrilege. He can live in homosexuality. He can live in all manner of evil. And every law broken. And he can prove by the proper interpretation of the book that he's a saint. These souls shall burn in a special place. We long for the old days when murderers were just murderers, and they murdered people because that's what murderers do. 
But they never said they were saints. So in a most wicked time, and here James, St. James speaks about the battle. St. James in the epistle today, the feast of St. Simeon, he speaks about the battle. He says, you know, that it must, it, it, the, the necessity of temptations. St. James in the epistle. Brethren, blessed is he who endures under trials. When he has proved his worth, he will win the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. We say, I love the Lord. I love him. But, you know, just like in the professional sports, I love my team. But the other team's paying a few more million dollars. So I have to leave. I love my dad. But he wasn't nice to me, so I've got to curse him. I love my religion, but these priests are too difficult, so I must leave. And we think that we can love without trials. But St. James makes it most clear. Remember, this is one of the books that a certain Martin Luther, who now burns in hell, threw out of the Bible. He didn't like James. Some Protestants put it back now because now they can't read. They don't have something called reading comprehension. But they really, the whole of the scripture they cannot comprehend. But this was too much for them. And so they threw it out. And James says what is said not only in the epistle of St. James, but from the beginning of Genesis chapter 1 until the end of the book of Apocalypse, everywhere it says this. For instance, our Lord Jesus Christ said in the gospel, He that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Big, huge, N-O-T. He that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> but he who does the will of my Father. And remember, Moses came down the mountain one day. He was carrying, if I remember correctly, there were ten of them. I think there were commandments. He was carrying ten commandments down the mountain, and two tables of the law. <clears throat> and he carried the commandments down the mountain, and he saw that the people rose up to play. And they were sitting against all of those Ten Commandments. They were worshiping an idol. They were immersed in impurity. They were doing all the sins against the Ten Commandments. And he took the commandments and he broke them. He then divided them into two groups. And he says, who is on the Lord's side? And some came to his side. And he said, kill your brother and sister. And 30,000 were killed in that day. Those that did not come on the Lord's side. He came down and they believed. He came down and they saw the commandments and they heard the word. But they were breaking the word. They were not following the law of God. It was already written in their hearts. And therefore, they were slain 30,000 in one day. And he had to go back up the mountain for a second 40 days. And during those 40 days, no golden calf. During those 40 days, no sin. Because they knew this time, Moses is coming back. And he came back again and gave them the commandments. Two trips up the mountain. Everywhere in the history of the salvation, Adam and Eve broke the law of God. <coughs> but then did it for the rest of their lives. But only those who endure in trials can be saved. And we all believe in our modern age. I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to be a good Catholic. I want to be a good person. And I check the TV commercials, and I check the education channel, and I check the psychiatrists, and I check the psychologists, and I check the modern universities, and they all agree. Every person is intrinsically good except Catholics. Every person is intrinsically good except those that follow Christ. But everyone else is intrinsically good and intrinsically wonderful and it doesn't matter what they do but St. James tells us 2,000 years ago only those that endure trials they shall achieve the crown and St. Paul all over these epistles says the same things it matters what we do <coughs> we human beings if we believe something it must pass into action 
Whatever is in our minds cannot just stay there, and it never does. Whatever is in our minds must pass into action. That's why the world today, for instance, the devil, what does he put into, into, into people's minds? All kinds of pornography. He puts into their minds all kinds of violence, all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of materialism. You turn on the TV and you have to have the latest computer-operated toaster that does your emails for you. You have to have it. And you know, therefore, what are you going to do to get that? Well, you've got to get a, you've got to get a PhD from university and some stupid, worthless thing so you can get a million-dollar job so you can afford the toaster. And so the TV tells you about materialism and greed. And it tells you you must live for the purpose of sin. You must live for the glory of the world. You must live with the purpose of sin, and people put it into action. And then they hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you just believe. Because we learn from Protestantism that all you have to do is believe that. Put it in the back of your mind. I believe in the Lord. I love the Lord. God forgives everyone. Do you forgive me because I just borrowed $50,000 from your safe last night? Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Try that sometime. <laughs> the fact is, when it comes to the Lord, no matter how much sin we do, no matter how many times we murder Him in our hearts, no matter how many times we violate His law, He must simply forgive without us changing, without us fighting, without us doing what our ancestors have done for 6,000 years. We read about Tobias. All the other Jews turned away from God. They turned away from God. They did not follow the law of God. All of that. But what happened? Tobias, he did not follow them. He stood firm in the law of God. And he taught his son, whom he gave his own name, you must follow the law of God. You will not be like the rest of Jews in this land outside of Israel. You will be a true Jew, and with me you will travel to Jerusalem. And he went the long distance to Jerusalem to visit the temple. And they came back. And when the Jews were killed and left on the streets, he buried them. And he said, it's better to die by the decree of the king, who said that you should be put to death for burying a Jew, than to break the law of God. And so he taught his son Tobias. And God sent an angel to protect him. We are now in the age of Tobias. He is a great saint for our times. All of the Catholics are wandering away from God. All of those that say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they use his name. They use his name. But there will be a special anger in heaven, more over the Protestant minister and over the person who says, I believe in Jesus, than the one who blasphemes his name. Because the one who says it like that and does not follow his commandments, who says it in this false way and does not follow his decrees and his teaching, he is mocking the name of Christ, mocking the name of our Lord. And this is happening everywhere in our age. Satan is mocking the name of Christ through those that call themselves Christian. There must be an enduring of trials. Brethren, blessed is he who endures the, uh, uh, the, the under trials. When he has proved his worth, he will win that crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And so he will find. No one should say, that needs to be tempted by God. God allows temptation from the passions. He allows temptation from the world. He allows temptation from the devil. But he always gives the grace to defeat the temptation. As St. Paul says, where sin did abound, grace doth, grace doth more abound. And so there must always be preachers until the end of time, says St. Gregory in his sermon. And, that, and, and we all know there's supposed to be preachers in the time. There must always be faithful Catholics until the end of time. What has happened in the Catholic Church? We begin to think like Protestants. Protestants believe that only the Bible saves, and that provides. And we Catholics believe, well, there were saints last year. There were good Catholic saints. I mean, St. Pius X was very holy, and uh, St. Gregory the Great was very holy, and all the saints of the last centuries are very holy, and that holiness is enough for me. As long as I believe in the holiness of Pius X, as long as I believe in the holiness of the saints, then I shall be saved. I don't have to imitate them. I don't have to walk down the path they walked. I don't have to fight the fight they fought. They fought, but we must. We're in a great war. 
And God always gives us a super abundance of weapons, a super abundance of tools. Remember Leo XIII in 1897, 98 or 99, there's just a few, a few years before 1900. Leo XIII had a vision in Rome. And he had a vision that the devil was unchained and that he would have a special power more than he had had in previous centuries for approximately a hundred years. And that's why he instituted the prayer after low mass, the St. Michael, prayer to St. Michael, the special exorcism of St. Michael that the faithful can also say. A little exorcism prayer you can easily find on the internet and it's good for you to say it when you any difficulties. He wrote that prayer at that time. And none of the exorcism is in the ritual, but the special exorcism of the faithful can also say. And he also made the decree that after low mass, that there should be the saying of the prayers, of the three you know, the, you know, the three Hail Marys and the prayer to St. Michael, the archangel. A very short, brief version of that prayer. Because the devil is more powerful at this time, therefore, who defeats the devil? St. Michael. So we call upon St. Michael. Remember also, where the devil is more powerful, Christ sends more power from heaven. He always sends more than what the devil does. And so we're in a time in which the devil does seem to have more power. He is near his total defeat, but he does seem to have more power. But, isn't it, but he's going to give us the grace to, to defeat him and to destroy him. And then also our Lord says, what's demanded? St. Simeon dies a martyr like many other martyrs. What do you need to do to follow Christ? And he says what's to, what is required in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 14. And that time Jesus said to the multitude, many, <clears throat> uh, if any man comes to me without having, without hating his father and mother and, <clears throat> and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If any man comes to me who does not hate, our Lord Jesus Christ is very strict. You must hate your father, hate your mother, hate your sister, hate your brethren, and hate your own life also. For the love of me, and who does not do this, is not worthy to be my disciple. Because he is a warrior who has come from heaven to earth to defeat the enemies. One of the great sins of the priests in the Catholic Church is nepotism. The popes a thousand years ago were punished very heavily by God because of the nepotism. That is, they gave the special benefits to their, to their brothers and to their, to, to their nephews and to their nieces. And then, of course, some of them had illegitimate children, and they gave them to them. And they considered their family of more value than Christ. But it is Christ who is first. And we leave the father and mother, we leave the family for another family, which is Christ. And also remember what our Lord said. There's a flip side to this mystery. Whoever hates his own flesh, and whoever loses his own flesh, shall attain life forever. He shall find it. And here's one of the mysteries of the hating of the brother, hating of the sister, hating of the father and mother. If we hate them for Christ, that is, we hate all the sin in them, and we're not attached to them because we, we use our friends and our families and our relations and our health and our pocketbook to do what? To be ties that pull us down to hell. So we break the ties. And when we break the ties, what happens? We become lifted up. When we lift it up, we pull our whole families with us. And we save ourselves and our families. Like St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who left his family and went to the monastery. He abandoned them all. And then what did he do? He came back. And he dragged his father to the monastery. And he dragged all his brothers to the monastery. And his sister into a convent. And they all became saints. He saved them all. And so how is it that we, we we're, and that have things changed? Has God changed his rules? God never changes. Never changes. And so there must be, in our times, we are required to do the same as our fathers. Our fathers... He gave all they have. And he says, therefore, at the, at the end of the, the Gospel, St. Luke says, what, what, when you're going to follow Christ, what do you do? Do you want to follow me? Whenever you want to become a doctor, or you want to become or build a tower, as our Lord says here, what do you do? You check. Do you have any brains? No, you're an idiot. You don't know, you have no brains. 
You cannot pass the, the, the smallest, you can't pass the, uh, the drawing class in kindergarten. You don't even get a smiley face on your paper. You can't become a doctor. Because you need to pass more difficult classes. Do you have what it takes to pass the classes? Do you weigh 967 pounds? You're not going to be a sprinter. Not going to happen. You must take into account what you have. What is required to become a sprinter, what is required to become a doctor, what is required to build a tower, what is required to build a house, what is required to have a family, and they, these men do these things. But if you want to follow me, says our Lord, what's required? What is required? If he cannot, if, if, if 10,000, 20,000, if he cannot, he'll try to make peace. And so it is with you. None of you can be my disciple if he does not take leave of all that he possesses, Christ demands that we leave all that we possess. The reason why he demands it is because we are living in an ocean. You know, the world is always seen as an ocean by the church. When you walk, when men are not healthy in an ocean, they drown. We live in an ocean. And therefore, if you go into the sea and you carry with you weights and you wear heavy clothing and you wear heavy shoes, and you take your possessions on your back, you will drown. And if you want to survive in the sea, you must remove all the clothing and the possessions, and then you can swim through the sea. Or you can even do like St. Peter and walk on the water, as our Lord Jesus Christ did. And so we can walk on the water, we can swim in the sea, if we remove all that we possess. And our Lord Jesus Christ says this is a requirement. You know why the world today most, so many souls are not willing to suffer even a little for Christ. The reason is because of the problem of materialism. We have more possessions than kings used to have. We have more things than all of our ancestors had, and it's hard to give them up. If someone asks for $5 and it's all that you have, it's hard, but it's only $5, you give it to them. But if you lose $500 billion, it hurts much more. And so it is with possessions. We have so many possessions, so many things, and they are made to drag, drag us down. We have to have the latest cell phone, we've got to have the latest computer, all the latest widgets and gidgets, and we have to have all these things, and they pull us down. And so our Lord says, all right, I made you a human creature. I made you to have the need of clothing. It says in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you worry about what you shall eat? Why do you worry about what you shall drink? What you should put on? The Heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. We all have to use money. Even those who take the vow of poverty, monks, need money. Even, and all have to have clothing. All have to have food. All have to have some place to sleep. At least a nice bridge or something to sleep under. Everyone has to have something. We all need material things. Who made us that way? God did. God made us to need food. God made us to need clothing. God made us to need the house to live in. He made us to need a little bit of money to use in our lives. But our Lord said, why do you worry about these things? Because remember, the lilies of the field neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but the Heavenly Father takes care of them. So the real reason why our Lord says, you must leave all you possess. You must drop it all. Because if you drop all the things you possess, you then have a ability to receive what he wants to give. You're leaving behind filth, leaving behind manure, leaving behind garbage, leaving behind things that will perish. And he wants you to leave all those things behind. And when we've left those things behind, we receive great treasures. And our Lord made it very clear, whoever does leave all things behind, whoever does hate his father and mother and sister and brother, he shall never be alone. Whoever hates him will never be alone. But whoever loves them because they're his, he shall find himself abandoned and alone. And whoever leaves all the things of the world, whoever leaves them, he shall never starve. He shall never starve. You know, in our present crisis, so many priests in the last 50 years. I remember when I was a child in the 70s, so many priests coming to visit Father Hannafin, an old Irish pastor in Kentucky. They would come and visit him. He goes, Father, uh, how can I want to see the Latin Mass? I don't like the new Mass, but where's my parish? How am I going to get my pension? How am I going to survive? What about my health insurance? What's going to happen when I get sick? I want to say the Latin Mass, but I don't see.